Good morning, everyone. Great to have you here, and I'm really excited to have the privilege and opportunity of introducing Raj Shah. As Dennis just said, Raj Shah just stepped down. He's just a month into a new role at Georgetown University, was for five years the administrator at USAID, where he really reshaped and revisioned that, that institution. He brought in the private sector in a big way, something sorely needed in global health, he engaged with faith communities. He, uh, he uh, incubated technology, really supported science. He got everyone to really come around producing measurable results and really, really monitoring and measuring what we're doing in public health and being accountable for the spending that is going into public health. Uh, th this new model uh, was, was seen in a number of initiatives that he put into place, Feed the Future, the Child Survival Call to Action. I think this was a major effort to revitalize uh, child survival and bring attention to ending preventable child deaths. It made a huge difference. Power Africa, Grand Challenges for Development, and the development of innovation ventures, which again really shone a light on innovation and science, and USAID Forward. The Feed the Future Alone initiative was credited for improving the nutrition of 12 million children around the world and more than seven million farmers were equipped with the tools that they needed to come out of poverty. Now, if that wasn't enough, he also managed uh, U.S. Uh, humanitarian efforts. As you know, we've had a number of major efforts over the past uh, five years that he managed. Prior to that, he was undersecretary uh, for agriculture. Pretty amazing, somebody who can cross over health and agriculture in this way, and actually created the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Prior to that, he was at the Gates Foundation for five years. That's where we, we met, uh, got to know each other. He graduated from the University of Michigan, uh, University of Pennsylvania Medical School and the Wharton School of Business. He's been awarded the Distinguished Service Award by Secretary Hillary Clinton and was named to Fortune, Fortune's 40 Under 40. It is a great honor to introduce Raj Shah. Thank you, Gary. That's very nice. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Gary. I'm so thrilled that my friend Gary is here uh, serving uh, at Stanford now and on campus, and I hope you will all take good care of him. He will certainly, I think, wow you with his uh, intellect and commitment to this work. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited because I do think it's possible to end preventable child death. And there are more than six million children this year who will die under the age of five. The vast majority of them will die of simple, easily preventable diseases, and will die in settings and environments that are resource poor all around the world, usually in developing countries. And that's what I'd like to talk about this morning, why I think it's possible to achieve that extraordinary goal of ending preventable child death on a global scale. The photo you're looking at is a photo of myself with uh, Senator Bill Frist and uh, Dr. Jill Biden. And we had an opportunity to travel to visit the Dadaab refugee camp during the Somali famine in the summer of 2011. And I learned in that setting that a famine is actually a measure of the number of children who die per day in a particular geographic region. And when we arrived, we met mothers and children who had survived a brutal trek, often 60 or 70 kilometers, often with children being held in the hands of parents and some dying along the way, to get to a camp designed for 40,000 refugees that was teeming with more than 470,000 people. In that setting, in the dust and the horror of that kind of extreme deprivation, it is sometimes hard to be hopeful. But actually, if you looked closely, you saw the signs of hope and the signs of innovation that can actually help us achieve a solution to this kind of human condition. I saw children that morning receiving vaccines that I knew cost a fair amount of money just a few years ago and would not have been available and accessible to them, in this case, the pentavalent vaccine. And today, new vaccines through the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization are being distributed all around the world, reaching hundreds of millions of additional children who would not have received them even a decade ago. 
later that afternoon, we went from the camp to a agricultural research facility uh, where we saw the fruits of more than 10 years of research in creating orange flesh sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes that have a higher level of beta carotene and provitamin A and that protect children from river blindness and other diseases that, are, are co that come with severe micronutrient deficiency. Gary mentioned the grand challenges in development, but by putting out challenges and calls for innovation, mostly among students on campuses around this country and around the world, we've been able to, in partnership with others, motivate dozens of new technological solutions that, if they reach the very poor, can save lives. We know and we've seen a steady reduction in child mortality from diseases like malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia. But a lot of people have questioned, is it possible to achieve those same reductions in the more complicated reality that still far too many children die in the first 48 hours of life from complications like birth aphyxia? What you're looking at here is the results of a project done by students at Tulane University and now manufactured by a company and distributed throughout Africa and parts of India to create a very low-cost CPAP positive airway pressure device that can help children uh, avoid death from birth aphyxia. And I had the chance to see this in action in places like Malawi, where it is already saving lives. The question, of course, is can this package of relatively cheap interventions, vaccines, childbirth attendants, uh, malaria bed nets, can they reach every child everywhere? And this is one of my favorite uh, data maps, but it's just, it was on the wall of, a, of the Sheikh Abdi Health Post in rural Ethiopia. And I think it just is what we need to do to solve the problem. Identify the main interventions that need to reach every kid, identify where the children are, create a plan for reaching them, and then measure performance against that plan. Couldn't be more simple or straightforward, but it doesn't happen all that often all around the world, especially in very resource-poor settings. And that brings me to what I think are the innovations that can help us end preventable child death going forward. This is a photograph of a, a lab uh, tech worker during the Ebola crisis response in West Africa. And I can tell you, as someone who played a role leading the response in West Africa, that in fact, we struggled with identifying where Ebola positive cases were and driving the solution of uh, effective isolation and supportive care to those patients fast enough. And one of the main reasons we struggled was it took far too long to get laboratory confirmation of Ebola positives, and it was too antiquated a system to have 25 different organizations talking about where the cases were as opposed to one integrated digital map pointing us towards cases in a real-time manner. The minute I started receiving in my inbox a spreadsheet every day that said, in this county, we have a positive today, we were able to start rapidly achieving success in bringing down the cases of Ebola. And just recently, we note that there are very few, if any, cases of active Ebola in Liberia today, an outcome that never would have been predicted, in fact, was not predicted in August, September, October, just several months ago. Another element of our capacity to innovate to solve this problem is our capacity to bring people together across different communities to come up with new solutions quickly. Part of why the Ebola crisis became a crisis was that it decimated the healthcare service workers of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. The very people on the front lines of protecting and serving those who got sick were the ones dying of Ebola. And they were dying of Ebola because, as you can see the health worker in this photograph, uh, whose name is Elvis, as you can see on the, on the garment, they were wearing a pieced together collection of items to protect themselves from the disease. The headgear itself was made of 17 different pieces that had to be put together every time they put on or took off their equipment. The hazmat suit was designed for first world air conditioned hazmat environments as opposed to a tropical environment. These folks were overheating 
20, 25 minutes into a service rotation. So we brought together partners at a maker's lab in Arlington, Virginia, from MSF, workers, healthcare workers from West Africa, scientists from NASA and DOD and USAID, uh, partners from Motorola, DuPont, and Kimberly Clark that make different components of the suit, and literally redesigned the protective equipment so that you have a suit that doesn't fog in the mask that can be taken off in 35 seconds instead of 12 to 15 minutes, that is far, far safer uh, so that healthcare workers can survive. And our capacity to continuously innovate in global health to solve problems that are urgent and long-term is what I believe is required in order to fundamentally end preventable child death. But there's one other requirement, and that's political leadership. This is a photograph of John F. Kennedy in 1961 signing a bill that created USAID, created the Peace Corps, and frankly put an exclamation point on a five to 10 year era in which the United States made a commitment that through our politics and through our leadership, we would reshape global institutions, support a United Nations, create the Bretton Woods entities, and modernize the way we worked with many, many parts of the world. Since that time, we've had successes and we've had failures. But the reality is, it's a bipartisan mission. With President Bush creating PEPFAR and the huge investment in HIV AIDS that today is such an important platform for achieving global health objectives, to President Obama actually taking that platform forward and dramatically increasing resources to end preventable child death with a 40% increase during a very tough budget environment towards that purpose. This is a cause we can all get behind. And the reason it's important at the end of the day is because saving children's lives in resource-poor settings is not just a great and morally important health outcome to achieve, but it actually creates stability in communities. Families start to have fewer kids per household. People invest in the education for each of those children, including the girls. And all of a sudden, an economy and a society defined by high birth rates, low education rates, low per capita income starts to look more and more like a stable, growing, prosperous, and hopeful society. And at the end of the day, that's the kind of world we should want to live in. So thank you for having me this morning. I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I look forward to a short Q&A with Gary. But I do want to leave you with the message that the subject of this conference, bringing innovation and technology to this challenge, is hugely important, not just for health purposes, but for shaping the kind of world that keeps us safe, secure, and prosperous over many decades. Thank you. Sir Raj, thank you very much for these inspiring and insightful remarks. Um, I, I'd like to open it up to the audience. We're going to have an opportunity to have a Q&A later this afternoon, so I'll save some of my, my pressing questions for this afternoon. Um, we have some mics here if people want to come up to the mics and, and ask some questions. Uh, maybe while people are gathering their thoughts and coming to the mic, I do have one thing I'd, I'd like to ask you here. Um, you thought a lot about delivery uh, of innovations. I mean, we're, we're here talking about super exciting advances in science but yet ultimately those advances need to get to the people in, in some of the regions that you were illustrating. <clears throat> in your experience, what were the greatest challenges around actually translating that science into action on the ground and, and how can we work together to overcome those? Well, I, I think that's a very important question and it's why I did a little extra research to find that uh, photograph of the Ethiopian Health Post. Data and real-time data that tells us where are children dying of simple diseases? Where are children receiving the basic package of interventions that we know can save their lives? And where are their gaps? Uh, that to me is the, is the single most important information solution required to achieve the end of child death around the world. And when I look at how a lot of the new technologies that I know were discussed yesterday and will be discussed today get introduced in these settings, they often and reasonably get introduced to the populations in the setting where, uh, that have some access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. So when you roll out a rotavirus vaccine in India, for example, you're far more likely to reach children who need that vaccine and for whom you will reduce the morbidity of diarrheal illness for children 
Uh, but it is harder and more challenging to find those kids who, if they got that vaccine, they would not die. Right. That requires that extra trek into rural communities. That requires fighting for providing services in urban slums that often are informal, unmapped, and sometimes even considered, quote-unquote, illegal tenements. Mm -hmm. So the global health fight has to be, in my view, more informed by real-time data systems that identify where the need is most acute, and we have to shift a, a greater percentage of our expenditure and effort on that in order to end preventable child death. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Got a question here. Uh, Ron Ariandro, Stanford. Um, wonderful presentation. My, my question has to do with um, there are so many people now trying to contribute to the global effort <clears throat> to achieve the objective that you, you gave, which I think is what we need to do. Uh, but my question is how well is it coordinated? Uh, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a Help Babies Breathe initiative and also an uh, essential care for every baby. Uh, the one is to um, address the issues of the, uh, of the health attendant and make sure that they have skills and knowledge to, to help a baby who previously was called stillborn, but basically was a baby who needed simply warming or, or some stimulation. So how well is all this coordinated? And there are universities that are working in hospitals, I know in Kenya and other, other places. Uh, so how, how do you get all these things to come together for synergy, or is that impossible? I don't know if it's possible, uh, I, and I don't know how to judge how well it's coordinated. Uh, global health, public investment in global health alone is nearly $30 billion a year. Uh, when you add in the domestic investment country after country on a public basis and private basis, it's uh, a significant global investment that takes place every year. Not as much as I'd like to see, but significant. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's possible to have a complete top-down coordination of that system. Uh, I, one of the things we did during my tenure was bring together uh, 80 countries in, in an effort to get everybody to sign a pledge to end preventable child death, create a country report card that tracked performance against that goal, identify priority districts like in India where 1.4 million kids a year were dying. They identified 132 districts that accounted for 68% of those child deaths and said, let's reposition resources, effort, energy, measurement, outcomes in those districts. I think that kind of coordination and, and strategic thinking is critical to delivering the result. Then what happens underneath that, I really hope real-time data systems, public and open information, crowdsourcing solutions uh, allows you know, hundreds or thousands of distributed problem solvers individual physician groups, individual public health entities and projects to then go after and solve the core problem. So I think we're getting better at it every day, uh, but I think ultimately coordination will only take place when everyone's looking at the same data, committed to the same set of goals, and willing to subject themselves to the same accountability for results as a global community. And, and we're getting better at that moment by moment, but we have a long way to go. Yeah, it would be great if there's some way to register all of the activities and actually accumulate data, um, understand better the successes and failures, and, and where to go next. Agreed. <laughs> question here. Hi, yes, my name is Nathan Lowe. I'm a medical student here. I had a question about bringing medical devices, the more complex devices like CPAP, into resource-poor settings. You mentioned that a lot of these are built at universities and especially often done as design projects by students. But from my own experience and also um, reading about this, these devices, especially at universities, really struggle getting past the clinical trial stage, getting out of the laboratory. So what type of business strategy do you think is necessary, whether a nonprofit to for-profit or somewhere between that and the spectrum? Thank you. Well, I think that's a great question because you're exactly right. The goal is not just to create a technology or an idea or a solution, but to come up with a business plan to scale it at the right cost point and get it distributed. In the case of CPAP, we worked with this group at Tulane. They were the winners of a Grand Challenges in Global Health competition that we did together with the Gates Foundation and so many other partners. After further product development, they received sort of startup funding, and now they manufacture that at larger scale and lower cost with the Chinese manufacturer, and they're distributing it through global health purchase and uh, distribution systems 
so that it's reaching places like Malawi and, and elsewhere around the world. But that kind of uh, case study is still the, is the rare event. And, and you have, I think, too much innovation that isn't informed by, okay, what's the business plan? Who's going to provide some startup funding for someone to think through getting a business off the ground? Where's low-cost manufacturing going to go? And how do you lock in enough procurement so that you're dealing in high volumes, lower cost business models as opposed to the alternative? So I appreciate the question. I'd like to see it happen more and more. But I'm encouraged that there's some new pathways to create that path to scale. Hi, I'm Bonnie Maldonado, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician here. Uh, great presentation. And I have a broader question for you around the UN Millennium Development Goals. As many of us know, those will end this year. And um, the question is, how, what hope do you have for the next stage of the, 2050, the Millennium Strategic Initiative, whatever it's going to be called? And where do you think it will go in terms of maternal and child health? Sure. Well, first, let me just say I think the Millennium Development Goals have made a huge difference because when you have so many large institutions trying to accomplish something, having a clear set of measures that we will at least periodically judge ourselves by is critical to that kind of alignment that we started the Q&A with. In terms of what will happen going forward, uh, I'm hopeful because I have to be. This is so <laughs> important, we got to get this right. <laughs> the sustainable development goals are currently under active debate. And uh, my one concern is that the, the Millennium Development Goals were so successful that there are more communities that want a broader set of measures and goals. And I think currently that something called the UN Open Working Group has 19 goals and 160 some indicators. And I, su I suspect that might be too complicated and broad to achieve the objective to which you've made reference. So I, I'd like to see that narrow. Uh, we have six or seven months to deliver success, and I'm rooting for my former colleagues who I know are <laughs> working on that every day. <laughs> Dennis. Hi, Dennis Wall. I forgot to tell you guys that you can uh, sit down on those couches. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want any? <laughs> That's all I had. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, uh, I, I was going to follow I was actually going to ask a question that I think is a really important one for this audience in particular. Um, how do we begin to train our students to think more creatively about, crea about creating solutions, innovating that, in ways that will enable you know, reach to developing countries, help helps solve many of the problems that are faced there that are problems that are uh, economical problems, right? So scaling at economies that are relevant to those developing countries. How do we do that? How do we get students to think creatively about taking their solutions that they're developing that work well now here, maybe in the United States, but certainly won't, won't work well elsewhere? Well, you know, that might be a great question to end on because at the end of the day, uh, if there's one thing I learned in five plus years leading USAID uh, was that student populations across this country have an extraordinary passion and commitment to this work. Our mission is, at USAID was to end extreme poverty and promote resilient democratic societies. And when I dealt with uh, my colleagues in Congress, for example, uh, who are not the student population, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's, there's a natural skepticism about what can America do and what should our role be and a process you go through to help folks understand, connect with, and contribute to a mission that has actually always defined us, and certainly in the last 60 years, that we've led on behalf of the global community. On student campuses, students are way ahead of everybody on this front. I mean, I, I would go to places, uh, you know, whether it was Stanford or Florida International University or MIT or, or any other setting, and I would just people and students in particular were already thinking through how can my contribution to the world be broad, be scaled, touch human poverty and, and sort of change, uh, change the world for the better. So I think it's up to us as uh, faculty members and others to provide more on-ramps for these students. Y you know, in my small contribution, USAID very much opened up the platforms to allow students to engage. There's a group called the U.S. Global Development Lab, and I'd encourage students here to go online and connect with that part of uh, USAID, which was designed to allow universities 
to be more a part of that global mission. Uh, I would encourage uh, faculty and others to help more students get kind of summer internships and opportunities around the world because uh, as I've learned, doing this work ends up changing yourself more than you, know, you actually change others. Uh, and I think the big new trend is applying s a sort of an, a very American focus on science, technology, and innovation to this task. It is not so much asking students to go teach English in a remote corner of the world today as much as it is asking students to say, okay, if you want to be a microbiologist, let's use your scientific interest to have the most impact in the world. And when we start talking that way, I find we just unlock possibilities we can't possibly imagine. And so I think you're in a target-rich environment here <laughs> at Stanford, and, uh, and I look forward to learning about what you'll do on that front going forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Raj, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Here.